now like to call the November 17th, 2020 Longmont City Council regular session to order. Uh, we already approved the minutes for October 27th. There's no minutes ready for this agenda, Mayor. Right, right. That's what I thought. Okay, cool. So do we have any agenda revision, submission of documents, or motions to direct the city manager? And Mayor, there was one um, document revision, not an agenda revision. Okay. What noted in the substitute ordinance for ordinance 2020-62 for item 12A1. Uh, let's go ahead and uh harold it's been a big day with COVID 19 and the governor and it's been a it's been a rough week so do you want to go ahead and report to us so i'm going to start with the final revised metrics uh, the old level red uh, became level red severe risk long-term sustained metrics or multiple metrics met and specifically what they're looking at is greater than 350 between Greater than 350 and 100,000 cases in a two-week incidence. It was just reported that um, the state, CDPHE, did move us to level red. Their county, they, they moved 14 counties. They indicated that they were going to move some other counties to orange. But the big change in level red, um, when you look at high-risk populations, um, is in, where we were in level orange, um, it was strongly advised to stay at home. Level red actually puts the high-risk populations in the stay-at-home category. So if you were in the orange level, it was up to 10 from no more than two households. So now they're saying no personal gatherings. Um, in terms of schools, schools is a little bit interesting. So K through five in person is suggested. Middle school, in-person hybrid or remote suggested. And then high school, they're suggesting a hybrid or remote. Another significant change is really to the restaurants. And so now they're saying take out curbside delivery or to go orders um, or open air dining. Uh, in terms of offices, um, in the orange level, we were at 25% remote work where it was strongly encouraged. They're now 10% uh, remote work is strongly encouraged. Um, gyms and fitness centers um, are at 10%, um, 10 indoors per room or outdoors in groups of less than 10. And then critical and non-critical retail is essentially staying the same as it was in level orange, 50%. With events, any indoor events are now closed. Outdoor events have been reduced to 25% or 75 people based on the size. This is really what we're seeing in terms of what, what the governor is reacting to. So we're definitely seeing uh, in Boulder County the growth, but we're seeing that really throughout the entire state. When you then look at the positive, the two-week po testing positivity rate, we're currently at 8.3%. But when you look at the positivity rate, we're actually at a lower level than Weld and Larimer. We've obviously been watching the Young Adult Gathering Public Health Order metrics. Um, so what we can tell you on this is we're in the same spot that we were before. Um, new cases and positivity worsened over the last week, and so we're just continuing to move in that area. Um, so this graph really says it all. You can see that we hit a high of 326. We hope um, that the trend that we've seen recently uh, continues in terms of where we're moving because that will make a difference in terms of the level red piece. And I'll tell something that's important in this is, you know, for a while we really started seeing fewer cases associated with college students, but now about 12% of the cases in the past week have been among CU affiliated Boulder County residents. When we look at this, the other change, and we hadn't seen this for a while, but we're starting to see it again, is actually the number of cases that are associated with long-term care facilities. And there are currently nine confirmed active outbreaks in the Boulder County long-term care facilities. Our five-day rolling average and daily case count is at about 220.6 cases per day. Obviously, if we continue on the trend that you saw on a previous um, slide, um, that number will continue to go down. And, and that's gonna be really important in terms of how we look at a potential move from red to orange in the, in the future. So what I wanna point out here is the red line is actually bolder and you can see the spike when we had it with the university and then, so we're, we're right about there. Uh, now we're gonna look at it in terms of uh, municipality. So you can see Longmont um, in terms of what we've seen since uh, the 1st of October and the cases per 100,000 were now the highest. Again, this graph is just a different depiction and it gives you the same look at the data per communities. Uh, dark blue Boulder, light blue Longmont, 
Louisville, Lafayette, and Superior, and then all the other uh, municipalities in this. And so Boulder uh, for last week had about 656 cases, Longmont 598, uh, Louisville, Lafayette, Superior 230 cases, and then 183 in the rest of the county. Highest cumulative rates per 100,000, they were in the 18 to 22, 23 to 24, 24 to 34, and 35 to 44. So basically that 18 to, to 44 range has really had the highest case counts recently. And I know this, this slide prompted a lot of conversation last week, but we are continuing to see increases in the number of cases of all school age groups um, when we compare it to the most recent two weeks. Now this is an important slide. 78.2% of the cases in Boulder County have a known um, race ethnicity. Again, seeing persistent large disparities among the Hispanic Latinx population. In the past seven days, 47.6 of our cases, or 506, have been among the Hispanic Latinx, and 49.3, or 524 cases, have been among white non-Hispanic categories. When we look in the testing, uh, again, remind you, 10-1, we're at 4.7. Today, we're at 8.5. Or as of 10, 1, 11, 16, 9 a.m., um, you can see, you know, how many tests we've been performing in Boulder County. This is just um, a different way to look at where we've been moving in terms of the positivity. This is actually a good sign, you know, and it, who would have thought when we were actually just before here and we were below 2% that we would be seeing this move to 8.5% is a good sign. All of that's going to come into play when we look at the way they've constructed the new dial. Another example of what the different age groups have been doing over time. Seven-day rolling average of PCR tests with positive results. We've had a lot of questions about hospitalizations. Um, th this is cumulative over time in terms of what we've seen. So this really talks about our hospital resources. We have 108 ICU beds available in Boulder County. Total 108 ICU beds, we have 19 available as of today. So we have 145 available med surge beds, um, adult critical vents, um, 50 total, 28 available. Um, Non-critical vents, you can still see that all of those are available. This is the statewide hospitalization piece. And so the blue is confirmed COVID-19. The brown is um, under investigation or the light, the tan under investigation for COVID-19 in terms of uh, deaths among Boulder County residents who've tested positive. And you can see how um, from about June 6th to the end of September, um, anytime you lose a life, it's tragic for a community in the county, uh, but it looked much different. Um, we are starting to look similar to where we were um, in April. And I think that's part of what they're also um, looking at. Um, about 71% of the deaths to date have been among the long-term care facility residents. And this is the key COVID da data resources. I will also have the full slide, slide deck that I'll get to Don. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to add three things here. I'm going to talk about testing, hospitals, and then uh, vaccinations really fast. I'll talk a little bit about the disproportionate amount of cases in the Latinx community. So Carmen, as Carmen always does, partnered with public health to develop some kind of targeted testing sites that we've done two of so far. We have bilingual staff down there, um, kind of resource kits available for everybody coming through. And both times we've done about 120 tests or so. The larger sites are ripping every day, 100,000 or 1,000 a day. So I think the testing available in the community is good. We are hospitals. So today, unfortunately, we did break our previous record. We had 91 in the hospital today. In Longmont, we had 29, which is a significant number for, for Longmont beds. And I can give you those up-to-date numbers for today. Um, they're a little bit misleading, though, because we don't break out COVID ICU beds versus regular hospital ICU beds. So those could be filled up with, you know, strokes, heart attacks, whatever. But as of this morning, countywide, we have 108 total, 72 of them, <clears throat> excuse me, 15 of them are still available. The med surge availability right now is 112 in the county and 14 in the city. But I think the big message that, that Harold was giving really does 
hold true is they are full. Um, the hospitals are very concerned about staffing. Um, it's not only just fatigue, they've been doing it a long time, but their staff is also affected by quarantine sickness. But an important point is they are not seeing any, any if any, spread inside the hospital. From July to September, there were nine deaths in the county. We had nine last week. So there's some trends that we would certainly like to uh, get ahead of here. Quickly on to vaccinations. Um, this is something we get asked a lot and there isn't a tremendous amount of information on these yet. And there are significant logistical issues involved with vaccinating a entire world. So I would not, I wouldn't think about anything that's gonna be community available before March, April-ish. So we're not planning for any widespread distribution before then. There's have heard from the county is the contact tracing that they are trying to do that the virus is so far ahead of it that they're really not trying all that much and they don't have the staff to catch up either. All right, that concludes our COVID-19 update. Thank you guys. Uh, let's move on to special reports and presentations. The 2020 Colorado APWA Parks and Trails Award for the Dickens Farm Nature Area. Yeah. Uh, Steve Ransweiler, Senior Project Manager for Public Works and Natural Resources. Top Parks and Trails project within a large community um, and for Dickens Farm Nature Area. And we're very proud of uh, this award. And I'm gonna turn this over to Pete Adler to uh, present this award to the city council. Thanks, Steve. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Pete Adler and I'm the, I'm the Colorado chapter delegate to the American Public Works Association. On behalf of the board of directors of the Colorado chapter of APWA, I'm here tonight to recognize the city of Longmont for the Dickens Farm nature area. All right, you wanna go ahead and read the consent agenda for us? You bet, Mayor. Item 9A1 is Resolution 2020-122, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving a cooperative agreement between the city and the Longmont Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 6 for January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2021. 9A2 is Resolution 2020-123, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving a cooperative agreement between the city and the Longmont Professional Firefighters Association, International Association of Firefighters Local 1806, for January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2021. Sorry, 9B is resolution 2020-124, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and Adams State University for a memorandum of affiliation permitting educational experiences and counseling. 9C is resolution 2020-125, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and the County of Boulder for the acquisition and management of the McLaughlin property. 9D is resolution 2020-126, a resolution of the Council of the City of Longmont, Colorado, finding that the petition for annexation of a parcel of land located in Boulder County, State of Colorado, known as the River Set Annexation, generally located north of Boston Avenue and east of Sunset Street, substantially complies with the Colorado Revised Statute Section 31-12-1071. And 9E is resolution 2020-127, a, res a resolution of the Longmont City Council supporting public health agencies in slowing the spread of COVID-19. I would like to pull item um, B and E. Councilmember Waters? Uh, I'd like to pull item A. I'm gonna move the consent agenda, uh, less A, B, and E. Aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Aye. All right, uh, the, the motion carries unanimously. Okay, I move uh, resolution 2020-124. I'll second it. All right, all in favor of resolution 2020-124, say no for the debate, say aye. 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 Opposed, say, opposed say nay. All right, resolution 2020-124 passes unanimously. All right, let's move on to resolution 2020-127. I was gonna pull that as well. Let's take a vote. All in favor of resolution 2020-127, say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, resolution 2020-127 passes unanimously. Go ahead and move uh, amendment 2020-02 to the 2020 CDBG action plan and close the public hearing. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, great. Let's move on to item 12. Tonight we have several folks joining us. Uh, I can't. We have representatives from Costco. Um, Jennifer Murillo will be presenting uh, on their behalf. 
representatives from the Golden family um, and the development team that's been working on this. We were approached by a developer um, with the potential of locating Costco and Longmont. We realized we needed a new location uh, based on the, the infrastructure and economics there. We didn't pick a particular location. We set a bunch of options based on what we knew the space requirements would be. What are the benefits of locating Costco and Longmont? And so now I will actually turn it over to Jessica to talk about um, the, the Costco econom economic impact from her perspective. Jessica. Thank you, Harold. Um, so I'll just real quickly talk about uh, from an economic development perspective, we typically look at retail and primary industry projects very differently. Retail projects, we're typically looking at significant fiscal benefits, which you'll hear about the significant fiscal benefits, which are the direct uh, dollars into city coffers that uh, Costco location brings to the community. Mayor yeah. uh, Bagley and members of council, uh, Dale Rademacher, can take a few minutes here and just step through some of the uh, highlights and key elements of the particular uh, agreement that's in front of you. Public-private partnership agreement or the P3 agreement, there's several key elements. As I mentioned, this is a, a 48 acre site. Uh, it's immediately south of Ken Pratt Boulevard and immediately east of the Harvest Junction um, uh, commercial and residential areas. This is a, a site plan that gives a little more detail for the uh, proposed layout of the Costco facilities. I mentioned earlier, Council, that there are several clawback provisions in the, in the, in the main contract and to um, protect the city's investment. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to um, Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Jim Golden. I'm glad to pick it up from here. I'm going to get into the financing and the project cost first. The total cost for the projects, and that's the Costco and the affordable housing project, are $23.6 million. The city share of those costs are just below $13 million. The developer costs are $3.6 million, and the Costco costs are $6.9 million. So this here uh, are the city's project costs. Costco project is $9.9 million, and the affordable housing is a little over $3 million. So now, uh, looking at that from a, uh, a net basis after um, deducting the amount of uh, estimated cannibalized taxes that would be drawing from other retailers, it would be just over $3 million of, of net uh, new sales taxes in the first year. So in December 20, um, uh, we'd be looking at the execution of the P3 agreements and the related agreements that we discussed. The agreement calls for uh, sometime prior to July of 24 that Costco would, uh, would uh, move to open the warehouse. One quick note, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, thank Jennifer and mm -hmm. uh, Reggie Golden, um, two people that uh, I really appreciated working through the details on this particular project. Dr. Waters. Uh, I move ordinance 2020-62. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. If there's no further discussion or debate. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, ordinance 2020-62, the substituted version, passes unanimously. I'll move ordinance 2020-63. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor of ordinance 2020-63, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, ordinance 2020-63 passes unanimously. Dr. Waters? <laughs> I'll move ordinance 2020-64. I'll second that one. All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, ordinance 2020-64 passes unanimously. Let's move on to short-term rentals. Mayor Bagley, members of council, Joni Marsh, assistant city manager. This is a little bit of a continuation from our July 14th uh, council meeting. So just to a uh, reminder of the current definitions in the code, um, both for council, but also for the public who may be watching this evening. Um, so again, here are some of the additional rental requirements that are currently at play. Once so some of the other um, items that we took notes on, and I went back and watched the last meeting a couple of times to try to make sure that we 
um, got a general feel for some of the questions council had, but also some of the common themes. And I think really some of those themes were frankly around compliance and asking applicants really to be accountable for submitting documentation to us. So let's go ahead and vote. And the, uh, the issue is, the motion on the table is uh, to direct staff to bring back in the ordinance, um, making, it permiss making it permissible for Longmont residents who have a second home in Longmont to use such yes. home as a short-term rental. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Nay. So the motion carries five to two um, with council members Christensen and council member Peck opposed. Before we started tonight, Harold told me that we could take 12C and 12D and put it on a future agenda. To I would postpone C and D to a future meeting. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, so the ayes have it unanimously. Uh, let's go to mayor and council comments. Council member Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I'm going to give a, a really fast update on some of the things that are happening on RTD, if you don't mind. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who called in or emailed, especially mayors and commissioners coalition and the Metro mayors on retaining that FISA account, the Fast Tracks internal savings account, because not only did the board vote to retain it for two years. They put $17 million more into that fund, bringing it from $120 million to $137.3 million. So that tells me if they can do that, perhaps maybe their financial picture isn't as dire as they would like it to be. Our new director who's going to replace Judy Lubau, Lubau is Eric Davidson. We are, according to Phil Greenwald, going to have the uh, Front Range Rail coalition come to our December meeting. We can use this $137.3 million to build platforms, to pay for the engineering study, to make it a shovel-ready project to get funding from Dr. Cog and the federal government. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I guess you can say anything you want to in public invited to be heard. I'd like to talk about um, free speech because, uh, you know, when I write things in the newspaper, I am representing myself. It says that in italics, you know, right under my columns that my opinions are my own and don't necessarily represent the opinions of the city council or the city of Longmont. So I think it's a little bit disingenuous for people to call up and, uh, and, and, uh, essentially initiate a debate about a per the personal statements of a member of the council at the city council. You know, it would be slander if you could slander an elected official to say that I am against fracking. What I am against is what the people of Longmont are against, which is paying for stuff that people in other cities get the benefit of. I'm not for fracking, but what I am for is protecting the people of Longmont from it. If Joe Salazar succeeds in forcing us to go to battle um, with those people because they're drilling underneath the city of Longmont um, and we lose that battle, then it could, uh, it could have us back to a, a situation where we have uh, a well pad five miles from the swim beach at Union Reservoir inside the SUNY limits. And that might just be the beginning. And I'd also just like to end this little rant by saying uh, that the sponsor of Senate Bill 181, which is the law that not very good lawyer Joe Salazar is trying to use to get fracking bans for other cities, I do know that I don't want Longmont to have to pay for it so that somebody else gets a fracking ban. And that's why I wrote that column and it has nothing to do with city council business. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Just as a consideration of my colleagues as well as the city staff, I would like to let you know that I did participate in a panel for the Community Foundation of Boulder County uh, Leadership Fellows Group this afternoon with State Senator Stephen Fenberg, uh, State Senator-elect Hawkes uh, Lewis, 
uh, County Commissioner Matt Jones, as well as Boulder City Council member Junie Joseph. I did my best at all times to only relate council positions that were voted on and then making sure that all other positions were clearly my own, as well as avoiding disparaging any staff members or council members, even when baited directly. Outside of that, uh, I would say that I was very encouraged by the other elected officials and what I felt to be synergy among the city, county, and state level elected officials as far as to um, some really good things that are going on at the state, county, and local levels for Boulder County at large. So thank you. Scott Waters, you want to say something? Okay. Well, I'd say good on Mayor Pro Tem for not disparaging other council members or or representing council positions that he hadn't checked with folks. Well, I, I just would, just a couple of thoughts. One is that I think the public invited to be heard portion of the of the agenda is one of the most important parts of the meeting. I, I mean, I, uh, it, it was way more fun when we were in, in person and it's limited, you know, in this format. Uh, but I do think it's one of the great aspects of local government. It's the form of government closest to the people. And it's like every Tuesday night, it's a town hall. I just think it's a, it's a, it, it is, it differentiates or distinguishes local government from other forms of government. When I get the chance to do that as a, as a resident by writing a letter to the editor and, and, in, and people using their first amendment rights to criticize me for using mine and labeling it as whining, I just think, they think that's an interesting, interesting commentary on how the process gets used. But just to set the record straight, uh, I did write a letter to the editor. I didn't think anybody would read it. And I'm not certain the people who commented on it actually read it because it was really the, the, what I said was a total distortion from what I heard tonight. For the record, I'm opposed to fracking inside our city limits and within 2,500 feet of our city limits. I voted for the 2012 fracking ban. I would vote for it again if it was on the ballot. We fulfilled our first obligation to Longmont residents and that is to act on behalf of, on behalf of their health and safety. Which, but my real opposition that I tried to express as a resident, not as a council member, and I was explicit as well, that I wasn't representing anybody's views but my own as a resident of Longmont, my objection was to a fundraising campaign to, to cover the cost for an appeal that would keep us as defendants in a lawsuit and have further deplete Longmont city resources um, to accomplish what we've already accomplished in a time of austerity. That, that was the concern. I'd love to be engaged with, with residents where we have a chance to, in, to go back and forth. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting to, you know, to have the comments where we can't respond when we're called out individually. Thanks for the opportunity, Mayor Bagley. Uh, Councilmember Doyle Faring. Yeah, um, so I just, I wanted to, um, to add, so last Friday I was in on that Zoom meeting and it was the special meeting for municipal officials with Governor Polis's response advisor. And um, it was really just, it was concerning to see the numbers, to see how it, we are progressively getting worse with this virus. But really it comes down to each one of us and our behaviors, our actions, washing your hands taking this virus seriously, wearing your mask. You know, I keep asking questions about the sustainability. Let's look pinpoint specific for, for daycares, for schools, for different businesses that would warrant a different kind of structure for quarantine. But again, it's gonna come down to each one of us and our behaviors, wearing your mask, social distancing, limit those those gatherings, do a little sacrifice on that end. So we're not collapsing our economy. So we're not hurting our students, our children and our mental health. So that's all I have to say. And we'll see everybody later. Thank you. Bye-bye.